and read the other two works that go along with one of them. Right, so she does cinematography work, she does a lot of access to set systems and rules. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I mean, you worked with me as well. Yeah. Uh, who else is? She played Kate Steve. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and we do a lot of cinematic film access sometimes. Takes and a minute. I have Takes a But you started with um, and then in the did you see wait see I did I was the first and I asked her you were the first one if you can believe it 90 1992 oh, turn this thing off okay Okay. Uh, work that the organization has been doing. Yes, for thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, nice. So, have you been a board member? Mm -hmm. Nice. To be in an environment to or for somebody. Play something that's been mm -hmm. and the demand and then it is sort of it is enormous, but okay. too, oh, you know, if we take a similar step back and, <laughs> and, and you've been and you've been at university for a while now. No, I was moved from positive to negative in the past ten years. Okay, uh, we're going to get started now. Thank you all for coming back. <laughs> the first two panels talked a little bit about the institutional actors inside the justice sector, the judges, the prosecutors, and so on. And this last panel, we're going to widen the lens a little bit and talk a little bit about how the outside actors can influence positively and negatively the ju the strengthening of the justice sector. We heard, uh, I think, in the previous panels some talk about civil society. There were references to the media, uh, the bar, and so th those are the kinds of things that this panel uh, is here to explore. After this panel finishes, there, we will not have a break. We'll go straight to the keynote speakers, that's correct? So we'll just have a, a pause, if you will, and then we'll go straight to the keynote speaker and then we'll finish up. We will have some question and answers uh, for this panel, and then we'll have the keynote speaker with question and answers as well to follow. So with that, I will hand off the panel to our moderator. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the most difficult session of the day <laughs> to start with because we're full and our, our bodies are doing their work and they're wanting us to go to sleep. So I'm going to try to keep it entertaining best I can. Anyway, my name is Geraldyn Busnardo, and I've been doing international development for a number of years. I've been and lived in um, several different countries, primarily in the Middle East, um, in a nutshell. Um, 
To my left is Malcolm Russell Einhorn, who is from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And to his left is Sarah Ratchery uh, from UNDP. And our last uh, person is Scott Fulton, who is the president of the Environmental Law Institute and was previously the general counsel for the US EPA. I think I heard somebody earlier say they were from the EPA. Was it you? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Any <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, so as Steve said, this is about uh, civil society. So I'm going to um, I'm going to pose questions, and we're going to do a first responder up here. Whoever feels the most comfortable um, answering the question, and uh, try not to hog it all. <laughs> okay. So. What kind of reactions uh, have governments and judiciaries had with civil society's involvement, particularly the bar's involvement in judicial reform? And if they've been critical or skeptical, how have you been able to win them over? Or how have we, any one of us could answer these questions? So um, can I take a stab at this one? Because this is, actually I've done a lot of work in civil society of late. So um, <clears throat> I, um, I have found in the different countries that I've worked in that the government, and it depends on if the, if the, if the civil, I haven't done a lot of work with bar association, so maybe somebody can follow up with that. I've mostly worked with NGOs uh, who provide uh, legal aid or who provide social services to <clears throat> vulnerable populations like women, children, the disabled, that those groups of people. N and I find, luckily, that the, the government is pretty open to that because it's an easy win for them. If they are seen to be supporting someone who's providing wheelchairs for someone who's disabled, it's a positive for them, so they're all about that. So I find that they haven't been critical or skeptical. So I wanted to put forward the success story first. So maybe one of you might have a different experience with the bars, uh, uh, the bar associations, or any other uh, civil society organizations. Sarah? Sure, well, good afternoon, and uh, just let me say thank you to the organizers for inviting UNDP to be at this uh, event, which has been fascinating so far, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this question really speaks to the heart of how we're delivering our services in many contexts, um, because the reality is in, in, in almost every country, but particularly in developing contexts and least developed countries, for instance, where the poverty rates are double what the, the global average is, the demand for legal services and, and uh, access to justice far outstrips the supply available. So governments have to adapt. They create partnerships with civil society, with bar associations, and, um, and those partnerships, uh, they, most of the time they thrive, but of course there are, are instances where you know, there's steps back and steps forward. There, it, it also depends very much on the national context. And the history of the country, um, and the history at times also of the region, where there can be regional frameworks that impact how, how these services are delivered. So it's a very complex picture. And um, where we've seen changes in the picture, um, well, firstly, just to say, I mean, one example would be the situation in Jordan, where, for instance, when we talk about legal aid, the state only provides legal aid for the most serious crimes, for instance, those where capital punishment or life imprisonment is, is, is potentially... Um, on, on the cards. Um, all other provision of legal aid is provided by partnerships, pro bono or civil society. There's no other provider um, for the less serious crimes, either criminally and certainly not civilly. Um, and in the least developed countries, about 75% of legal aid is provided by civil society. So it really shows how vital these partnerships and these players are uh, when it comes to actually del delivering access to justice. When, when we've seen you know, these partnerships uh, change, or when, for instance, where a state decides they want to be more assertive. So they make a decision, for instance, a lot of Eastern European countries have based on the jurisprudence from the European court. Um, they've, they've developed more assertive legal aid systems and laws, which have given an outsized role for the state compared to what it used to be. Used to be. And then you have a situation where a bar association, which used to provide a lot more of the pro bono support, um, now has a scaled back role. Mm -hmm. And that's something where, of course, there can be you know, issues in terms of, of how that's coordinated and so on and so forth. 
Um, before I relinquish the, the microphone on this particular point, I think as development practitioners, our role there um, is certainly, of course, to re recognise the realities on the ground, um, but also to try to ensure that where we're providing support through our development projects and programmes, that we're ensuring that these services have the elements of quality that need to be in place for it to be really um, to the standard of the types of justice and the types of support um, that need to be provided. Um, I think that's one of our key roles as, as people who are overseeing and de designing these interventions. Mm. I'll stop here for, for now. Thank you. If we, uh, if we think of judicial reform uh, as broadly including both the also the idea of judicial capacity building, um, uh, most of the work that I've been involved in kind of operates within that uh, sphere. Uh, thanks to the leadership of the United Nations Environment Program, which about 20 years ago launched a uh, judicial capacity building initiative um, based on the belief that um, if other elements of government are, are not functioning well in terms of advancing uh, the environmental objectives of the country, uh, that the judiciary, um, equipped with an understanding of the of the uh, the phenomena that it's dealing with in environmental cases and some basic case management tools um, can actually make a fair amount of progress uh, on its own. But also the notion that the judiciary is, uh, in, in most cultures, one of the most revered institutions in society. So uh, if the courts um, take on uh, environmental cases in a way that uh, kind of registers and underscores uh, their significance, um, in particular is reflected through their, uh, the remedies that are meted out, um, then uh, that can have a transformative effect in society uh, more broadly. Now, I, I would say that, uh, um, that in the work that we've done, um, the judiciary has uh, generally been fairly receptive to the engagement of civil society actors uh, as part of the formation um, for uh, this kind of capacity building work. So, for example, the Environmental Law Institute um, has done a lot of work uh, training judges around the world, um, 30 countries, several thousand judges, um, and programs administered by a civil society organization, the Environmental Law Institute. Uh, that said, we have observed that, um, that uh, judges uh, typically uh, are most receptive uh, to the uh, instruction or thought, if you will, um, offered by other judges or former or retired judges. And there's a certain uh, hierarchy to receptivity. Uh, judges uh, that community first, uh, perhaps uh, academic institutions, uh, including organizations, uh, non-advocacy think tanks like like mine, second, uh, with advocacy groups or anyone who's perceived as having an, an advocacy interest, um, probably being the, the least uh, desired or, the, or the, uh, the community that's approached with the greatest uh, skepticism um, by the courts. Right, I think um, we have a, a in, uh, we talk about advocacy and watchdog actors that I find in the developing world, there's a lot of uh, resistance to the, those folks. Um, that's uh, those, those types of actors. Um, Malcolm, can I, do, can I move to the next question? No, oh, uh, absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> quick, I'll try to be quick. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I think you, but you hit on uh, a point that I think needs to be reiterated that was reiterate that was uh, mentioned earlier about the watchdog nomenclature about adversarialism there's there's a certain edge that some groups have that is both uh, stylistic but also threatening to some judiciaries because of the sophistication and alien ideas that are being imported um, and that's a delicate balance uh, that adversarialism is sort of basic to uh, what's being sought to be uh, advocated in many cases, but um, but I think there is there is a certain skepticism or wariness in many countries, which, not to be monolithic, can be uh, very different in a developmental regime 
that um, is looking actually to improve governance doesn't mean that the judiciary is itself necessarily that developmental, but the, the regime leadership can um, send a signal that mm -hmm. um, administrative failures, which often give rise to the need for litigation or the problem with litigation getting out of control, either because of um, problems with uh, uh, the definition of rights, um, ambiguities in the law, or uh, just bad bad management and capacity in certain agencies, you get mm -hmm. a situation where the regime takes that bad news very seriously and in effect says from the cabinet of ministers or wherever, you know, we need to, we need to solve this problem. And going back to the groups, the groups that are most problem solving oriented and amenable to showing systemic uh, problem data that is not just uh, vindicating this, this right but saying, we know you have budget issues, we know you have capacity issues, let's figure out a way to do this. And the better judiciaries in some of the middle income countries are now adept at dealing with economic and social rights, for example, and figuring out how to convene um, the major stakeholders to remedy some of these problems. Yeah. So it's not, a, it's not a, uni a unitary phenomenon of sort of you know what, what happens with these regimes regardless of the the nature of the groups that uh, that are pressing the rights uh, agenda. Thank you. That is a good comment. <laughs> <laughs> Let me move to a particular um, actor, the media, and ask how how can the media be encouraged to obtain and publicize more empirical information? Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard about the fake news. Uh, problem that we're having in the United States. But so focusing on more empirical information about case volumes, uh, budgets, case outcomes, with an idea of spurring not only change in the judiciary, but also in the administrative agencies where such cases are initially generated. Who would like to take a stab at that one first? Okay. I'll take Thank a you, crack Scott. at it. Uh, um, in some respects, the, the challenge with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the media or the journalist community is not unlike the challenges with the judicial uh, community um, in that uh, uh, a key objective is to, to bring understanding and knowledge and literacy, if you will, um, that uh, allows for discrimination between uh, important and, and unimportant. And, um, I, I think there's literacy work that can be done um, with the community of journalists that uh, would probably be beneficial work. I mean, we, we at, the, at ELI have done some um, uh, journalist uh, literacy programming around scientific uncertainty, for example, um, and, uh, and also around uh, climate change, sort of climate change for journalists, what are the basic things you need to understand about this phenomenon. There really isn't any reason that that kind of programming and information uh, couldn't be shared uh, about the plight of the judici judiciary, um, challenges, uh, metrics, uh, uh, how we know whether the judiciary is uh, doing a competent job or not, or uh, what the resource situation is, that sort of thing. That, that could be part of a, a literacy campaign for journalists, I think. Uh, I've had uh I'm working in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, find that the media is often targeted in a way that can be dangerous to them, dangerous to their families. Of course, we've seen those kinds of experiences coming out of Russia, that this is a, a major problem. Have any of you worked in those kinds of areas where you, I struggle with this question, how do I work with the media and how do I work with folks that are frightened to engage? Um, and I just wonder what you, what you might, what your thoughts are on that. Russ, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Malcolm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think fear is often a, a problem, but I think the ignorance and education challenge is, the bigger, is really the bigger issue. There's a sense that um, there aren't any good stories out there except the, 
you know, scandal stories or the murder stories or that sort of thing. And yet um, people need to be given the background to talk about the judiciary uh, properly. But then in the same time, they need to be incentivized to say, you can actually sell newspapers by telling a really good human interest story about land grabbing, about disability rights, about pensions that aren't being paid, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And you can often bring in not just the poor, but the middle class who often share some of those uh, resentments or problems. So, um, mm. I, 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 so I can't speak personally in terms of my work. I mean, I've, I've worked in Uganda where people talking about you know, corruption and politically sensitive issues are absolutely under threat. And uh, I, I will commend many of the donors for putting money into protecting their rights um, and putting up money for legal defense, et cetera. But I personally haven't, haven't dealt with that. But I think the bigger opportunity area is to, is to incentivize journalists and, and really give them you know, significant training mm -hmm. um, over a period of days or weeks to tell the stories intelligently. Do you... Uh and, and do you think that that will reach to the administrative agencies? Because we're not talking just about reforming and informing the, you know, reforming the system and informing the public, but actually making sure that that information gets to the administrative agencies who are oftentimes responsible for providing the services that we're talking about. Sarah? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think one of the, the former, um, Judge Bennett from the former panel had a fantastic story about how he, he would never speed down a central causeway in case he ended up on the front page of the Washington Post. Um, so, of course, there's that element to it, but um, it's a global trend that we're seeing is shrinking democratic space, particularly in the developing context, and there's an increase in reprisals against journalists. It's incredibly mm. concerning, actually, the numbers of uh, journalists who have lost their lives you know, for doing their jobs. But it also uh, speaks more broadly to accountability in general. There was this previous comment about watchdogs, but an, a really important institution at the national level are, are, are human rights institutions, ombuds offices, and they're also facing reprisals. So unfortunately, it seems to be part of, a, uh, of what we're seeing, unfortunately, as, as a trend at the moment where that's, where that's occurring. Um, and of course, we need to support a vibrant media for accountability purposes, but we also need to understand in certain contexts, particularly where there can be exclusion of large parts of the population or discrimination, um, the media may as well be subject of elite capture in some of those contexts. They may ne not necessarily represent everybody in that or represent the interests of everybody in that, in that country and, and particularly the excluded and marginalized. So the media hold people accountable and the media also need to be accountable. Um, to the populations that they serve in terms of their objectives. So it's, it's a very complex picture in that respect, just to, to add that, that, that point. Mm -hmm. Right. We oftentimes don't think about business or private enterprise as having anything to do with the judiciary or even being part of civil society, but in fact they are. So what I want to uh, put out here for uh, the panel is to what extent can business associations and other private sector uh, enterprises or actors, how can they help spur judicial <coughs> reform efforts? Either in a way, I mean, I think the obvious way is that they spur commercial development and um, what have you, but how, uh, how can they, how are their cases handled? How, how do they participate in the process? And how can they make an impact? I'll go back to the be wary of monolithic uh, <laughs> analyses and judgments because it's very context specific, but also uh, many business organizations that one would hope would be influential and be representative are either not or they are toothless uh, and really don't aspire to engage in advocacy. Many of the members are really inclined to do things quietly and behind uh, closed doors and under the table, uh, et cetera. So I think the, the hopes that are placed on the business community in the traditional way we'd like to think about it in terms of uh, outspoken advocacy and putting forward policy papers and things like that is, is usually misplaced. That being said, in any given area, I think there's really quite a bit of um, opportunity to bring in 
influential allies um, in a reform effort who are um, upset at backlogs or uh, um, you know distortions of justice that are going on either in the regulatory sphere or um, in the commercial uh, courts or commercial chambers. So um, I think there are many, many instances where uh, business interests have aligned with a number of reform projects, but I just think one can't necessarily um, expect it to be what what we would like it to be in most countries, uh, except <coughs> again in those developmental regimes that really have a kind of commitment to um, improving the administrative state in their in their uh, in their uh, backyards. I'll just mention that uh, uh, we're seeing what we think is an increased interest in the part of the business community in getting behind rule of law work and um, and. Uh, rapidly emerging economies, like uh, China, for example, uh, where uh, um, we're, we are getting contributions from uh, a number of companies at this point um, to do uh, uh, work that, uh, that they see as uh, holding the promise of leveling the um, playing field for competition between uh, these companies, which are uh, multinational companies trying to do business in China. And, uh, and homegrown competition uh, in China. So um, uh, step one is just understanding that this is in the long-term commercial interests of, uh, of all companies that are internationally engaged to get behind work that uh, is supportive of, uh, of rule of law formation and no more important contribution in that regard than uh, uh, than getting behind uh, the judiciary. I'll also mention the, a project that uh, uh, we have underway at this point where um, a number of companies um, uh, are working with us as a convener of sorts uh, with the, the Ministry for Environmental Protection um, to uh, have a conversation about how environmental regulation is, is taking place in China. Clearly, there's a hope that as part of that conversation, uh, concerns, worries about the uh, predictability and regularity of, of, uh, of, uh, of regulation in China can be brought forward. Uh, but there's also an understanding that there needs to be uh, something uh, positive for the Chinese government in this conversation. And the positive is the sharing of best practices and, uh, um, and pointing to best uh, technologies for pollution control. Uh, the kinds of things that can serve as reference points for the Chinese government uh, in forming up um, the regulations that will govern not just the behaviors of these high-performing multinational companies, but also uh, their Chinese counterparts. I, I was going to say, I was going to add to that, if I could, and then I'll call. I, one of the areas uh, that I find uh, that's, that businesses can participate is, and especially in a country where uh, there may be um, a, quite a backlog is when is in supporting or introducing uh, alternative dispute resolution, ADR, mediation, uh, because then that helps not get caught in the quagmire of a huge backlog of courts. Um, because we, anyway, so I wanted to bring that out, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. I think this is such a critical question and I think it's something that the rule of law community is a little bit behind the curve on, um, if I may say. Um, one in five people on the planet is either employed by or supported by someone who works for a multinational or their supply chain. That's 20% of the global population. So how business does business matters to everyone. Um, and what we've seen in, for instance, through the Sustainable Development Goals, which I think somebody mentioned this morning, um, which I was glad to hear, which is a new framework for development that all member states signed on to in 2015, is a particular focus on partnerships. Mm. Um, the notion that member states in the UN system can come in, you know, it's just not, it's not how it works. We've, we've learned that the hard way o over a long period of time. And um, what we're seeing now is the business community, um, you know, coming out, joining those partnerships and specifically looking at some of the goals that are really relevant to rule of law. And one of them to mention, which hopefully you're all familiar with, is goal 16 of the SDGs, which talks about peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. 
uh, because it's in businesses' interest that they're working in peaceful, just and inclusive societies so that they're working in, in, in societies where rule of law works, where if there's a problem with arbitration or as one of the previous panelists talked, that there's a means for them to seek redress and where there's stability for their workforce and increased labour output and all the other reasons that we know of. Um, and I, I go to quite a lot of discussions about this and we actually facilitate with UNODC a very unique partnership um, of member states, the private sector and civil society on goal 16, specifically looking at how the business community can support goal 16. And there's so many fantastic initiatives and innovations and so on and so forth, but we're still learning from each other. But I think the rule of law community in this respect has a lot to learn from looking at the human rights community. Um, which uh, always entertains me as someone who works in both fields that there's this false division between the two. Um, but there are these guidelines called the Business and Human Rights Guidelines and they bring together thousands of companies on, on, on how to be better uh, corporate citizens but moving beyond corporate social responsibility and actually talking about frameworks of accountability. It's very, very big in the environmental space. Um, so I actually think that there's already more going on than perhaps some of the other panellists, but I also think the rule of law community needs to understand and learn from some of the progress that is still very relevant, I would argue, to rule of law, but isn't called rule of law, um, perhaps because people have less comfort with human rights language, but that's actually a false, uh, false division, in my view. That's a very interesting, that's a really interesting point. Did you, Scott? Malcolm, did you want I, to I would just to say I think I'm, I'm really glad you made that point because I was really referring a lot to domestic business interests and the fact is the international community does have a huge amount of, of influence and power Absolutely. if you look at the supply chains and the, the different commodities that are uh, <coughs> the, life, the lifeblood of many of the countries we work in. So the, both the advocacy but also the, you know, even the quiet clout is mm -hmm. impressive that they can bring to bear in many of these countries. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what about foundations? Is there a, is there a role for foundations in in judicial reform? Uh, are there limitations to their engagement? I don't have experience working with foundations myself, but maybe one of you have had that experience and can uh, share with us. I can start us anyway. I, um, I, I think the answer is yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> foundations are very much needed in the mix uh, of this work. And uh, uh, the good news is I think that many foundations um, uh, are uh, increasingly seeing the value of working with, uh, with anchor institutions um, in the, the, the countries of strategic importance to them and the judiciary is very appropriately emerging um, as a key anchor institution for the reasons I mentioned earlier, which are that uh, if, if other elements of government aren't functioning well, if you have the judicial piece working properly, um, then it's still possible um, to make progress on, um, on society's important uh, objectives. So, um, I, I think uh, foundation, some foundations are kind of warming to this space, um, and, uh, but I think there's greater opportunity to be realized, and frankly, without the support of foundations, um, uh, our progress in this area will, will be greatly hampered because public resources, governmental resources, are on the decline, not the, not the incline. Um, and there are only two places to look uh, when uh, government resources start to uh, diminish. Uh, one is to the foundation community, the other is to private sector. And uh, those are the places that, uh, that need to be cultivated uh, in the modern era, I think. Mm -hmm. Sarah? I totally agree. Just to complement that, I mean, in the U.S. you have a, a very um, strong and proud traditions of numerous foundations working in this space, OSI, Ford, etc., which do tremendous work and I think one of the things they really bring to the table as well is a longer term engagement and they're building up national capacity for sustainability. I've seen that myself in parts of Eastern Europe when they're eventually scaling down and pulling out. They've created a national constituency to continue the work. They have a longer term view um, and that's really critical. But I mean, a lot of the issues around foundations also relate to what we spoke about in terms of civil society. Is it a space where they can work? Do they have the mandate? Does it make sense in the national context, et cetera, et cetera? But I think what we also need to, to consider is that some of these external actors, foundations, civil society, um, 
they are filling quite a unique space because in particularly in post conflict settings, you know, there's there can be a breakdown of the social contract between excluded groups or affected groups in the state. There can be a real distrust in terms of the providers of assistance and those who need the assistance. And that's where foundations, civil society, so called external actors, although they can, you know, be actually legally embedded in the structures to to support um, access to justice, but external actors can have a hat that makes sense in certain contexts where there is really a deficit of trust. Um, and I think foundations supporting that work and at times you know, really building the national capacity to do that work is, is a really critical role. What are your, what are, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, oh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that um, um, that, that vital space you know, is also tenuous because precisely their, um, either the foreign funding is, is a threat um, and they're being vilified for reasons that are either wholly implausible or somewhat plausible because they have a reform agenda that is, mm -hmm. that is somewhat adversarial. Um, but I think some of the better groups um, have been able to work in a more problem-solving way and are also, you know, relative to the judiciary, are not only bringing uh, impact cases or individual cases, but are actually publishing sort of reports on systemic problems that are very similar to what a good ombudsman's office would do. And I think that's very, I think that's, I mean, it, it, many regimes would find that ho wholly embarrassing, but I think a, a number of regimes find it actually very helpful to, you know, if it's, if it's done in a very objective way that Here's what the data show, and by the way, we collect this data. We are as a valuable source for you of data that you may not have or that your agencies aren't collecting. So I think it's, it's, it's a very exciting area, but I also think that the, um, uh, I, I think the experimentation that goes on under foundation funding is, is something to be always um, pushed because so many of the donors are stretched, strained, um, and having to do large procurements as an administrative matter that aren't more risky, that don't take, you know, despite the encouragement to embrace failure, um, it still isn't really happening. And the, some of the foundations really are able to do that um, and make it really part of their identity. I think, um one of the challenges I see with foundations is judicial reform, as I think, I hope I think most of us would recognize, it's not a it's not a shiny toy, and it doesn't gather a lot of attention, and it's not I'm not going to get a big pat on the back because I helped fix the judicial system as a foundation. Uh, I'll I'll get more re, I'll get more uh, attention if I. Uh, in the environmental area, if I clean a river, if I'm Bill and Linda Gates, I'm going to dis distribute thousands of computers or what have you. Um, how do we, because what you guys are, what, what you're talking about and what you've mentioned is providing data, providing information, which is would go to the media. Seems like that's a nice connection. But how how do we... How do you get a foundation who, who, how many foundations out there want to work with judicial reform, do you think? Well, my sense is that uh, that foundation interest um, tends to revolve around um, a narrower set of criteria than judicial reform in the abstract or in, in general, uh, very difficult. Uh, to get foundation support for uh, an international program to build to advance judicial capacity or to push judicial reform um, in in certain areas, what is possible to rally support around is something that's more localized in effect. So a a judicial engagement in region X or in country X that is of strategic importance to the foundation. Um, uh, or um, a training that is uh, centered on a subject matter um, of interest to a foundation. For example, I was at a conference uh, last week in, uh, in Europe, uh, the Our Oceans con uh, Conference, 
a lot of foundations were present there. Those were all foundations that were focused on uh, ocean protection. So uh, a, a judicial program um, that, uh, that is focused on um, enabling these marine protected areas around the world in developing countries, that, that might have some traction with, uh, with those kinds of foundations. But I agree with you uh, completely that in, the, that in general, in the abstract, um, this kind of long slog towards uh, uh, better uh, global effectiveness within the judicial community is a, is a hard thing to rally uh, um, support around, financing support. Sarah? Thank you. I, I'm reminded of the comments made by the former judge from Georgia this morning about how they've been doing judicial reform for 25 years in Georgia and it's not over yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are long, long, long processes. They don't have a start and an end date that we can point to. Um, but saying that, I don't think um, at times when we talk about data, the um, recognizing the challenges mentioned by the colleague from UNODC about the types of data that we have, which is another challenge, but how effectively we're selling the importance of, of functional and strong rule of law institutions as a broader enabler for development across societies. Um, you're not going to eliminate poverty in a meaningful way or ensure gender equality if you don't have a rule of law system that works. So how can we also um, move outside of our own closed community and make a, a broader argument um, from as a development practitioner we're looking at the interlinkages between the different types of support we provide and we would argue that strong and inclusive rule of law not just strong rule of law but inclusive rule of law um, ha is, is an accelerator for development on so many other frames and so many other aspects of, 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 of civil life. So um, I think maybe we need to look at the data arguments. There's a lot of challenges there, but I think you're quite right, Gerilyn, but we also need to consider you know, these broader impact arguments as well and, and put together a narrative that makes sense in the national context. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Did you want to add anything to that, Malcolm? No. Okay. <laughs> What about, um, so this is, I think we're gonna have a little bit of time, a little maybe extra time to talk about, <clears throat> I have two questions left. So one of them is what are some of the key lessons that we've learned in working with actors outside of the judiciary? And I'd like to start with you, Malcolm. Okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you define it as non-judicial actors, then that opens up a, a much broader uh, space that includes uh, other government, um, other government actors. And I've, I've spent a lot of time working in the um, administrative justice space, which is not really a field yet, I would say, but it's sort of this nascent um, understanding that uh, judicial cases as such um, are often, um, you know, they have, they have filing fees, there's access to justice issues, they are civil cases, they are not regulatory administrative cases where the vast majority of people experience uh, the bureaucracy or the government. Um, whether it's uh, pension issues, uh, land issues, birth certificates, I mean the overwhelming place where people confront their government and justice issues uh, are in the bureaucracies and the cases usually go to uh, the courts if they go there at all out of frustration and one hopes um, there is some access to allow people to actually litigate whether it's through a legal aid group or on their own um, uh, their own their own effort so uh, all I will say is that, is that there is a wide open space to find these intersection points with not just what foundations find interesting and in their own subject matter space, but real places where as a matter of visibility and volume, the judiciary actually has a vested interest in solving either a backlog problem or an embarrassing, uh, you know, uh, uh, misprision of justice or something like that. And uh, this is obviously, as I said at the beginning, a lot easier when it's a developmental regime that really cares about things. But that's one of the interesting uh, opportunity points is that there are many more regimes that um, have players who are ready to 
try to solve a problem, not necessarily in the agency that is the cause of the problem, but in other parts of the government. It could be the ombudsman, it could be the cabinet of ministers that's embarrassed by you know, the two agencies that are misperforming. Um, but it could also be different levels of government. And I mean, I'm currently working on a project in Rwanda, which is a, as you know, a very autocratic, very, very closed space. And yet, because it's a developmental regime, it's interested in promoting um, administrative justice. Um, we have gotten quite a bit of cooperation from the bureaucracy in several areas, and we are focusing on the local level, which is where 90% of the decisions are issued because it's a decentralized um, state. So what you have really are, um, and of course this is coming from the top down in many cases, but you have frustration on the part of the citizenry in many of different administrative areas, and you have the regime saying, we can do better, this is embarrassing, and our local, um, our local uh, administrators are not performing well. So we are going to use, and this happens in many other places around the world, whether it's Indonesia, decentralized regimes, uh, China, um, the government will say we are going to, uh, sometimes at a cost to um, fairness to the local administrators, we are going to solve this problem through a, a, a kind of interesting alliance between legal aid groups, the media, and senior officials taking the time to analyze what the problems are and provide the training, provide the resources, and maybe provide the <coughs> discipline that's needed to uh, solve these problems that are often systemic um, in nature. Um, and we're working on uh, public employment, which employs you know, still a large percentage of the population that has issues of you know, unfair discipline, unfair promotion practices, et cetera. Land expropriation, which is a very hot topic, um, and, and really the government there is, is often taking land for developmental purposes and could have squashed this and said, you know, don't embarrass us, but they are interested in um, creating fair compensation for land that is seized. Um, public procurement, another hot um, issue, and then labor, labor, private labor regulation. So, um, so these offer interesting problem-solving um, coalitions. Um, not to say that, again, this isn't very sort of top-down and sort of cagey, both for purposes of, of, of uh, external consumption uh, and public consumption, but um, they have a legitimacy problem that they have to deal with. And if they are losing support, including among the 85 or so percent of the regime uh, of the country that is Hutu, that are often rural and are on the receiving end of bad treatment by administrative officials, they have a very serious public relations problem, a serious development issue because they're not helping people um, rise out of poverty and they also have a, a very significant ethnic problem. <coughs> so, um, so defining it in terms of different alliances of private sector, uh, sorry, public sector actors, and we're working with a legal aid group, we're working with a think tank that assembles um, uh, public information processes. Uh, the think tank, we do survey data to uh, identify some of the biggest uh, problems with, um, uh, that, that are experienced by the citizens, but also some of the bigger legal and regulatory inconsistencies in the law all of this will be fed into a set of recommendations that the government, uh, through workshops that we've been um, sort of having at different intervals, will take and perhaps use, we hope, for legal reform, training of public officials, and then ultimately um, public education efforts as well that include you know, rights, rights awareness, but also um, also educating citizens that in some cases they are in fact bringing frivolous lawsuits. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, it's not just the reputational cost, there's dollars and cents attached to uh, the outlay of funds for the judiciary to deal with these cases. And the Minister of Justice has been quite outspoken in 
having his um, um, staff um, not be essentially burdened uh, disproportionately by a certain handful of cases that are coming out of um, both bad district governments and then um, uh, bad um, judicial decisions from below that are that are sort of at the mercy of the uh, the record, the judicial record. I mean, the administrative record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, from um, from working with mostly NGOs, I, I think, and I, and maybe Sarah, you, we have similar experiences in this area, rather than you know, rather than the more empirical. Uh, foundation and data. I, I find that with uh, the lessons that I have learned uh, with uh, working with NGOs is that one of the primary concerns is that uh, they're in, some of them just pop up because they hear that there's some money available uh, to support a legal aid project and the, the miraculously, well, we don't know it's miraculously, but they manage to find executive directors, they staff the whole project, they've got the attorneys, and the lesson is that they have to be very closely monitored. That if you just release them out into the public, the, a lot of executive directors uh, end up uh, take, I, and I'm not, by no means am I saying that this is an absolute across the board every NGO, but there is going to be or there will be some NGOs that that's what they're going to be looking for is an opportunity to make, uh, this, is an, uh, this is a money-making opportunity for them. So it's necessary to keep a very close eye on the finances, uh, go out and do field visits, make sure that you're monitoring and that they're providing good legal aid, that they're not just saying, I had an experience in Egypt where uh, the NGO was would bring in a couple, it was a family law mediation program, and the, the NGO would say, well, can't you just go home and do what he says? And that'll solve the problem. Um, that's there's a lot of that. Uh, I think in part it's a little bit of the inclusive piece that you were mentioning. That that's one of my lessons uh, learned. I don't uh, at, at another at another in, in another piece of civil society. The second thing that I have found a struggle with is getting the data that you're talking about because this, the NGOs need that information as well. I, I, if I find that things are not, I find that programs are not necessarily um, taking into consideration some of this really uh, good information that's out there, the good data uh, that's being produced, or it's outdated. It's already outdated. And I find that particularly true in places of post-conflict, like in Afghanistan um, the, and, and, and Iraq places like that, that they're not getting, by the time, a, but by the time an RFP comes out, is the data's old. Yeah, so Sarah, I think you wanted to add something. Yeah, um, just to compliment and then an additional point. Yeah, we're supporting other actors to provide justice services essentially, and we need to make sure we're not supporting parallel processes or mm -hmm. processes that don't make sense from a sustainable perspective. So. I mean, in Bosnia, for instance, because of the national gridlock, um, most of our efforts are focused at the community or the the federal, you know, the cantonal or the RS uh, municipal equivalent level, um, and they have an aspiration to have free legal aid, for instance, and we've supported over a number of years the provision of free legal aid to almost every canton and municipality in the, in the RS. Um, through civil society. Um, but what we're also doing at the same time is working with the entities to try to pass relevant legislation, which will mean that, in fact, it's sustainable in the legal framework. Mm -hmm. If you go ahead and support only these providers without tying them in to the overall framework, you could, in, 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 in a sense, create um, a vacuum, certainly, when the money pulls out and you, know, you're not, you're, you have concerns around sustainability. Um, another thing we've learned is that uh, 
dealing with partners such as civil society, bar associations, um, other actors who are active in this area allows us an opportunity to be more innovative where governments don't have the funding to be innovative themselves. And, and one of the areas I want to mention where this is particularly relevant is when we talk about sexual and gender-based violence, mm -hmm. um, post-conflict settings. Um, the complexity around victims of SGDV is, 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 is massive because they obviously have legal recourse and legal redress they may want to pursue or they may not, depending on their circumstances. They may also have medical issues, psychosocial issues. Mm -hmm. They may be facing uh, challenges on so many different fronts. Only providing a legal recourse without looking at the multitude of, of needs and services that we could provide a more holistic um, offer to that population is a missed opportunity. Um, and we've worked with a number of actors in several countries now in Africa and we've si seen real results um, in communities in Kenya, the number of um, reports of rape increased tenfold in just three months by putting in so-called one-stop shops where victims can come forward and receive psychosocial, medical and legal support at a more holistic approach. And that's where, and now obviously the government's of course involved with that in any case, but that's where when you bring other actors with different experiences, we can also build on that. And we have similar results in Burundi and some other, not full results from DRC, but some results in DRC. So we need to be innovative and we need to be able to pull these good examples. But as, as it was mentioned at the very beginning of this day, there is no uh, set scenario for every single country. Everything is different. Um, and then one other thing I would mention in terms of our role, and it goes back to the point that you just made, Geraldine, is um, whilst we're supporting these multitude of actors who at times can provide services that the state cannot, either through lack of funds or willingness or various other reasons, our role as practitioners, certainly from the UN and I'm sure um, throughout this room, is again to ensure the quality of what is being done and to make sure it's meeting the standards that it needs to meet and that it's not, for instance, as you alluded to, watered down justice or justice that doesn't make sense or going under the guise of justice but it's not effectively delivering access to justice uh, to populations. And I think another way that we can do that, I just want to mention something that hasn't been mentioned so far today but I think in, in many developing countries is really important is the role of paralegals. Mm -hmm. um, because we see a lot of really good evidence of where paralegals are able to use their education, their training, and their skill sets as well at the, at the subnational, local level to be able to really have a much more holistic approach and to be able to provide services that can, can make a real impact and, and can have uh, some real results. Again, the quality has to be there. They need to be supported and trained properly and so on and so forth. But there are other actors within the legal community, such as paralegals, and of course we talked this morning about clinical education, law schools and so on and so forth, that really are doing very, very important work uh, in this sphere. And by strengthening, for instance, law schools and clinical education providers, you're ultimately going to be strengthening the Bar Association and the health of the judiciary. Uh, and of course there's a symbiotic relationship between both. Mm -hmm. Scott? Uh, maybe a, a few thoughts on the lessons learned front. Uh, one is that, uh, that um, international um, mechanisms can matter uh, in terms of the forward movement in individual countries. Um, so in the environmental space, we've been the beneficiaries of some fairly significant um, international accords, uh, the most recent of which is the Sustainable Development Goals, one of which is very much focused on rule of law uh, in the environmental space. But this comes on top of uh, uh, many multilateral environmental agreements that, uh, that most countries around the world have signed up uh, to, uh, various declarations um, uh, dating back to the early 1990s that establish a set of principles that countries have agreed they're going to abide by. Um, all of that fabric and framework has influenced behavior um, on the national level and uh, receptivity uh, of national govern uh, governments to change and reform um, in the judicial context uh, and others. So this international drivers question is, uh, is important. Um, I think uh, the, uh, there's also uh, usually value and um, and, and parallel strategies. It, it's not enough for outside actors to see a need and a problem in a particular country and want to act on it. 
um, and to try to set wheels in motion to make that happen. If, if there's not also a strategy to at least try to cultivate um, openness, receptivity, interest, energy within the government itself, um, it may not be possible uh, to, to make forward progress. Uh, now, not in, not in all circumstances will there be receptivity, but wow, when, when there is, when, when there can be a, a sort of a core element of support that emerges uh, within the government in question, then it's possible uh, for, for magic to happen in those circumstances. And that leads to a, a third lesson learned, which is uh, working with people who have affinity uh, with governments um, is fundamentally important, not just folks who understand the issue, um, but also can relate uh, to government counterparts who uh, may make the difference in the success or failure of, uh, of an intervention that's uh, being designed. And I guess the last uh, lesson learned for me is the importance of being persevering and taking the, <laughs> the long view um, in this work and at times seeing uh, near-term failures as, uh, as longer-term successes. One little anecdote to share, I was at a, uh, a judicial um, training program um, uh, symposium in Africa uh, back in the early 2000s. I'll not mention what country was, uh, was the host, for reasons you'll see in a moment. Um, but there were, uh, I think, 18 judges from the host country who were participating in the program. Um, uh, we were all uh, um, getting energized about the importance of, uh, of accountability uh, under the law and uh, judicial integrity and other things and the delivery of that accountability. Um, uh, and the afternoon of the program, we received word that 16 of the 18 judges were, were, uh, were under investigation uh, for judicial corruption on an inquiry that had just been launched. So you could look at that and say, <coughs> oh my God, you know, we, we, uh, <coughs> we, were, we were spending all this time with a community that probably wasn't going to be able to take what we were um, providing. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, there's a success in that, and that uh, if these issues are being brought uh, forward, um, if integrity questions, important integrity questions are being pursued by the government, then uh, over the long haul, um, uh, rule of law interests will be served and judicial integrity will be enhanced. So um, <laughs> be persevering. I like to look at the two people that weren't under investigation <laughs> as the success. <laughs> um, our time uh, for questions for the panel has, is over, and so now I'd like to open it up to uh, the audience if you have any questions or comments that you would like to make. Don't jump. Don't jump all at once. Uh-oh. I had a question. Uh, in some of the countries that I've done judicial training in, uh, outside the United States, we've encountered a problem with judges being transferred very quickly, rotated. Um, and in some countries, they're rotated every two years. Um, in other cases, there are mandatory retirement ages of 60, um, so you can probably figure out I've probably crossed that threshold. But I think that while it doesn't seem like a very important issue, it has a tremendous capacity to affect how meaningful our efforts are. And I was wondering if any of the panel members, um, A, had encountered this problem, and B, had any thoughts on what role, if any, they might play or their relative you know, actors might play in addressing this, because I'm sure it's not a problem that's unique to the judiciary, but the judiciary, uh, certainly in Asia, seems to be, the career tracks seem to uh, transfer people much more than we would experience here in the United States. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. Uh, 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 one is, yes, I'd imagine that's a, <laughs> a problem that we've all encountered and uh, 
Um, and I think it begs a, a, a couple of possible responses. One is um, to uh, encourage us to, to the maximum extent possible, engineer um, these uh, interventions into the basic mechanisms uh, and standing institutions of these countries. So um, uh, we'll never be able to accomplish what needs to be accomplished if we're depending on um, intermittent interventions that reach only a, a, a group of people who may, uh, may not be there that long for all we know. On the other hand, if that same program um, can be hardwired into the judicial training or continuing education requirements uh, for that country, um, then you've got something that has some staying power, I think. Um, the other challenge is figuring out better ways that, uh, that we can extend the life of these interventions and, um, and uh, remote uh, learning uh, and those sorts of tools uh, really need to be um, the subject of increased resort, I think. Uh, and this is something that we're trying to figure out as well at the Environmental Law Institute is how can we, how can we take an intervention and basically multiply its impact um, by making that same intervention available to people who weren't physically present um, or might be wanting to participate in, in, in it remotely. Mm -hmm. I think one of the favorite uh, donor words that I've encountered is sustainability. And it's the, when I, initially I, I, I didn't quite understand what that meant. I wonder how, it was, okay. <laughs> I digress. But I, for training programs, um, we, the, if you transfer that knowledge locally to someone in civil society, whether it be the Bar Association, an NGO, create a training video, I'm, I'm, and I'm quite sure that you probably have already done these things, but that is probably one of the, uh, one of the most common things that I've um, exercised that, that we've implemented is to make sure that whatever we've brought, and we're only going to be there for a short period of time, and I don't think that that's going to change unless people are shooting each other, and then we'll stay there for a long time. But if it's just going into a country and doing traditional rule of law work, uh, the, is to leave whatever you've brought to the table, somehow you have to leave it behind. Because it's not going to change. They're going to continue cycling judges through, and it definitely, I think, is a problem in, an, in a number of countries. I've certainly encountered it. Sarah, did you, you wanted to add something? I would just add, and um, yeah, just building on the points that you've made about the sustainability of interventions, I mean, sometimes we try to incorporate, for instance, training of trainers so that you're building up a national capacity of trainers in country but i mean this is only these are limited we have limited effects in some cases mm -hmm. and then of course that you know the training as much as possible isn't a one off that is linked to some follow up support or some follow up efforts which can be tracked and which are clearly understood by the government when you initiate the process so indeed if there was some way that that was stopped that it would reflect badly on 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 or it, or it could reflect badly on on the assistance but these have if, if there's a determination for there to be movement, then you know they would have limited utility, but there are various different ways in which we try to manifest it at the national level, and they were just some of them to add. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Or next question? Stephen, you have a question? Okay. So what experience have you had working with the bar in trying to strengthen judicial institutions? Working with the bar. I, I'll just say <laughs> by negative implication, um, <laughs> not very good and the real impetus for change and competition has come from legal aid organizations that are principally, I will say, donor, donor funded, not exclusively donor funded, but but predominantly, and they raise the bar, no pun intended. Um, mm -hmm. They, uh, um, and I think Sarah was exactly right that the paralegal um, 
the use of paralegals is a force multiplier that makes those organizations sometimes extremely uh, successful because they are distributing the workload in strategic ways, in ways that get at the grassroots and enable uh, not just sort of statistical data collection, which I didn't really want to emphasize, but also testimony. So just even very qualitative case testimony that can be summarized in an impact report makes that organization not just a, again, a litigation organization or a counseling organization, but a public policy organization. And some of the very good um, legal aid groups have been able to really transcend their origins and be public policy players, and they have government people with government experience in their senior ranks, and so there's a very good division of labor between the way they do their work. So that's not really answering your question except indirectly, but. <laughs> I uh, uh, did not personally experience this, but it was uh, my understanding at the time that um, this would have been in the uh, right, right in the early part of the 2000s that uh, Serbian, the, the Bar Association in Serbia had a, had a, was very active in judicial reform and very successful in moving things forward. And then it all kind of dropped off. And, and it, and, but, it, but they did get things moving. They took to the streets, they protested. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I think we have some really good examples, um, some really good recent examples of where the Bar Association has been involved positively. Um, but just to mention, I agree with the points Malcolm was making. The Bar Associations also need their capacity strengthened. Um, we shouldn't see them as a panacea at all. They also need support. Um, and when we talk about clinical education, working with universities, ethics education, you know, this is an investment in the future health of the legal community that will be part of the Bar Association. So in Pristina, for instance, we do, um, and with so the University of Pristina, we have um, ethics training for law students, you know, a, a certification program essentially that they go through before they then become members of the Bar, you know, so it is a long-term process. But just to end on a couple of positive examples, um, the Bar Association has been part of the National Steering Committee in the Central African Republic, which has been nominating local magistrates for the Special Criminal Court, for instance, because they, with a number of other actors, have enhanced credibility um, in certain, certain spheres. Um, in Tunisia, following the revolution, there was a, a, an advocacy group made up of the Bar Association along with civil society, Avocats Sans Frontières, who um, established a, a judicial monitoring network. They monitored the processing of criminal cases over a two-year period, issued reports, presented data to the government, and made some very successful advocacy to change the criminal procedure code at the end of last year. Um, and the Bar Association was critical there because they also brought along the credibility of the legal profession. Um, but some of those entry points are more, as I think as Malcolm alluded to earlier, at certain times there's opportunities for those entry points. And obviously in a, 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 a situation like Tunisia where there's a complete change in regime, some of those opportunities are, are more obvious than in other cases. So, but but we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't forget the fact that the bar associations also require support where where we can and factor that into our programming. Right. Uh, just to just to add to add to that a little bit, uh, it seems to me that uh, this idea of the bar association being a, a change agent or being part of. Um, um, uh, the progression um, of a society in achieving its goals and ideals um, is usually something that associates with the mature bar association. And many of the settings that we're talking about, um, uh, the bar really hasn't emerged to that point yet. Um, so we, at least in our work in the environmental area, really haven't seen the local bars as being significant actors um, in engaging the, uh, at least in the formation of efforts to engage a judiciary or other, um, other institutional elements. In contrast, the American Bar Association uh, through the environment section and uh, the rule of law work being done by the ABA, um, uh, they, they do have intersections with our work and we see those folks. Um, um, and the opportunities that, uh, that folks have through the ABA 
to participate and engage and be be part of the change in other in other uh, countries and jurisdictions. But that I think is because we have a uh, we operate within a very mature setting here. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'll just add, uh, particularly to be responsive to Steve, that that not a traditional bar association, but a, a voluntary group such as the Georgian Young Lawyers Association is a kind of a conspicuous example of a place, uh, a, a group that at the right time played a very significant role in, in Georgian legal reform. And there probably are other examples of, you could say, splinter groups or new, um, new bar associations or groups that spring in to action in many countries during transitions that have been very successful. Right. Uh, an, an international would be the International Association of Women's Judges. They're very active in, uh, again, like a splinter group as opposed to a bar association. Um, they're very uh, in, uh, active in gender issues and identifying training. Uh, they've been a, a, a huge player in this area as well. Any other questions? Oh, yes, sir. Um, you, 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 you skimmed a little bit, I have to uh, uh, say, um, uh, over the topic of uh, private sector involvement, and not so much about uh, that you all seem to be looking towards the private sector for, for support of rule of law programs, but n not really touching upon much about the problematics of that. I mean, obviously, if Coca-Cola funds uh, judicial reform in Kosovo, um, uh, what's the chances that the Kosovarian uh, judiciary is going to be uh, deciding a case against Coca-Cola? Uh, I'm, I'm over um, uh, the, the, the stating maybe the fact. And the other question, uh, so, so your thoughts on that matter, like w how can we find ways basically to avoid that sort of um, potential conflict of interest? Um, and, and the second one is, um, have you had any experiences in specifically working with NGOs in improving the use of data um, to basically support judicial reform. One of my frustrations is in, in judicial reforms efforts that judges don't understand data. Um, sorry <laughs> to all the judicial uh, colleagues here, but th it's, it's very hard to, to explain data, even in very basic forms. And uh, NGOs could at least uh, potentially play a huge role in that. Um, I have myself not come across that, but I would be interested if, if you have. Thank you. Thank you. So the first question is uh, business. How do we limit, or not limit, but how do we, uh, where, what kind of a wall do we put up to ensure that there's not a... Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Scott. <laughs> It's, uh, it's not the most uh, sophisticated wall, probably, but in our setting, you know, we do receive some funding from businesses to do rule of law work. We just simply do not associate uh, the businesses with any particular projects. In other words, the resources that they're contributing goes, go into the general funds that we use to support rule of law work. So you would never see um, a, a particular intervention associated with um, a private entity, even though um, their contribution is part of what is making that uh, that work possible. So um, the the linkage that that presents the most acute um, concern that you've mentioned uh, or expression of that concern is avoided, I think, through that uh, that kind of construction. Sarah, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, there's lots of ways in which we can do that. And I think from a national perspective, this is where it's an, there's an added value to look at the international framework. Large companies work transnationally. If, if you don't want them to work in one country, they'll work in the next door country. So the international framework is very relevant here. And I mentioned earlier the business and human rights framework where there's a protect, respect, remedy, pillar structure that's been in place for about six years. Um, I think nearly 100 of the Fortune 500 companies um, have human rights policies in terms of how they do their work. Well, Coca-Cola does a lot of really good work on water sustenance and water preservation um, in Turkey and eight parts of Asia and so on and so forth. 
So companies, um, in terms of our partnerships, we, also, we, we promote corporate social responsibility. The UN, for instance, has a UN Global Compact, which in a sense it kind of verifies countries that follow certain, uh, companies that follow certain protocols and procedures and are considered partners. But for UNDPs, we also do due diligence procedures on our partnerships with companies to ensure that um, we are partnering with companies who are acting in a responsible way and living up to their responsibilities to the, the citizens in the country that they're operating in. So, I mean, it is a real question and we have to be cognizant of it with our partnerships, but um, what we're seeing more and, and we see it in the business and human rights discussions and now I think there's a lot of good work going on in the rule of law um, side as well, whether we're talking about pro bono services from legal companies, and I mentioned White and Case, who we have a partnership to do this with, because um, I know there are colleagues here from White and Case, but there's many, many companies. Um, but what we're seeing is a movement in the right direction. Um, and that's being led by really large multinational co corporations like Unilever, for instance, who have very progressive policies in this regard. But it's a long road. Uh, it's certainly not, <laughs> the situation is certainly not perfect, but there has been significant change in the last six years. And um, I think that the SDGs, and particularly SDG 17 on partnerships, where there's a specific recognition of the role the private sector can see in partnerships and partnerships for development, and that's definitely the message we're getting from Secret the Secretary General of the UN, um, is moving us along that, that passageway <laughs> um, faster than we have been previously, but not without concerns, not without pitfalls along the way, and, and uh, it's, a pro it's a process like most other things are. I would come back to the point on the uh, your second question, perhaps from somebody. Uh, I, I'm going to have to say I was so fascinated by that. I forgot your second question. Please forgive me. Staff data question. Oh, the, the data. data. Right. Um, well, who, who wants to tackle that question? The data experts. And I, I'll just say that in the in the interventions in the environmental space that's focused on the judicial community. Um, there, uh, uh, there, there are modules within those interventions that are aimed at um, uh, working with scientific or highly technical evidence. Um, there are modules that are focused on understanding uh, basic environmental uh, phenomena, so hydrology, for example, so that you understand how pollutants move within ecosystems. Um, that is seen as just as important um, uh, uh, education as anything connected to uh, judicial administration of cases and that sort of thing, uh, b based on the, the belief that if judges uh, are equipped with an understanding of uh, the, the matter that's before them and, it, and its relative importance, um, that they'll be better equipped and inspired uh, to properly administer justice in those circumstances. So I think your point is very well taken. This is, this is not something to be left behind. It's something to instead very intentionally uh, work into uh, these moments that we have uh, to, to influence judicial um, preparedness in the, in the broadest sense of that. I'd like to go back to your first question as well, which is that there's an interesting linkage uh, in addition to the what uh, uh, the other panelists talked about in terms of how to put in um, safeguards. If you have an active civil society that is monitoring uh, the judiciary, doing trial monitoring, or um, and and that's tricky. But when you have a case that's going to involve one of these large multinational or even large companies in the region, uh, you have to make sure that someone is there, whether it's the press, whether it's an NGO, somebody actively in civil society will have to, or should, could, might watch those kinds of cases and see how they come out and make sure that you know there's not anything uh, unusual, so to speak. Does that answer your question? Okay, any other question? Let, let me just oh, add, no, it's okay, on, on the data question. Um, so I, I, I think it's more a sort of reflexive fear than it is any issue of sophistication because the most of the data that is of interest to the judicial branch is pretty accessible 
easy to understand stuff. You're looking at, you know, case dispositions f predominantly. I mean, there may be some very technical stuff that um, involves very sort of nuanced issues of evidence taking or something like that in an individual case. But for, for a lot of the, you know, either backlog reduction or simple errors, sort of systemic errors that are going on, you simply need to present them with, you know, here's what your intermediate courts are doing. And do you see, you know, you, you, you can relate the objective data that you're showing them with aren't you um, not surprised that this jives with your felt understanding of what you see in these particular case areas? Or it could be you go to the intermediate courts and you say, you know, the stuff that you're seeing from the administrative agency um, uh, results in repeated reversals or repeated remands for additional evidence taking or some, whatever it is. It's something that I think most judges will understand and appreciate. Um, there may be resistance to sitting down and actually fitting into, into their schedule, but if you can make that, that cost-benefit analysis plain to them, that if you spend some time looking at this, I mean, it's the same with, with case management more generally, but, um, uh, but if you can also have a dialogue with other players in the system that doesn't violate judicial ethics, that says, we're seeing these problems. Um, you, the administrators in agency X or a district government Y are repeatedly coming up with problems for us <laughs> that are easily solvable and you're passing the buck, you're either not doing the job properly or you're not, in some cases there's, you know, there might be an exhaustion requirement or something on reconsideration where you're you're, you're not taking advantage in the agency of this other opportunity to look hard at the cases that are coming through the system and instead they're all being dumped into the judiciary. So I, I think the intuitive appeal is, is there and legal aid groups can be part of um, summarizing that information or as in the case of our project, um, we have a think tank and a legal aid group that are working jointly to summarize that, that information either from the judiciary and its own statistics or through um, survey, survey data of, of um, litigants in the system. Great. If I can just add to that, um, yeah, I think Malcolm's point about the, the data availability for judicial processing, disposition rates, appeal rates, et cetera, may, may actually provide more information than perhaps in some other sectors. Um, what I'm more concerned about is what is it not measuring? Um, is, is it measuring um, excluded groups and their lack mm -hmm. of access? Is it measuring persons with disabilities who in post-conflict settings are one in three is, is highly likely to be subject to sexual abuse? Um, is the fact that they're not accessing justice being measured? That's the black hole of data, actually. And when we talk about strong judicial institutions, again, I would just go back and, and reiterate from our perspective, it should be strong and inclusive judicial institutions. And how do we, how do we really look to that issue of inclusivity and participation, particularly of the most excluded and the most marginalized in societies? And that's essentially circling around data that doesn't exist yet. That's the challenge. At the same time, we can't constantly just sit and wring our hands on it which I think there has been a lot of hand-wringing following the SDG adoption because we now have 179 goals and targets that we now have to monitor and measure. This is a challenge. Uh, one of them, of course, is access to justice, and there's a lot of fantastic initiatives. I mentioned the TAP network, um, Transparency Accountability Participation Network, looking at ways to measure access to justice. A lot of, you know, it's driven innovation, uh, bringing this framework, but it, there's still risks that we're missing at sometimes the most, the most, the population's most in need of our support. Um, so we have to keep wringing our hands. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just add one more thing, which is um, that raises what was mentioned in the second session about corruption, which is yeah, a lot of things are not visible and are are extremely important. And court monitoring should, in theory, help <laughs> identify some of that, either courtroom monitoring or other kinds of monitoring of, of litigants or, or case files, et cetera. But predictably, that's very hard to come by. There, there's defensiveness and um, 
people really are, yeah, in, in danger um, in some countries of, of um, when, when they attempt to actually do active monitoring. So it's a real challenge to um, do that in a, in a way that um, has some sort of umbrella of protection around it. And I'm, I'm just familiar with a, a, a project now in Myanmar that's trying to do court monitoring, and it is, it is really tough. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's criminal cases that are the product of some of the worst corruption, multi-level, multi-player corruption um, involving police, judiciary, um, and, and even plaintiffs. <laughs> I mean, even uh, defendant counsel. And, you know, getting your hands around that is, is very difficult and very dangerous. So it's right. a problem. Right. <coughs> we have a question over here on the right side. Well, my right side. Hi, Christina Sheets with Public International Law and Policy Group. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Um, been taking notes uh, furiously, so thank you for your inputs thus far. Um, one thing that both Sarah and Malcolm touched on that I wanted to get into a little bit um, in more detail without opening too big of a can of worms is that of the role of um, educational institutions and facilitating judicial administration in particular. Um, and if you could contribute your thoughts to any challenges or opportunities for formal engagement of educational institutions to improve the efficiency of judicial institutions, so both things like clinical programs, um, so engaging law students, of course, um, in, in kind of um, official mechanisms within the judiciaries, but also um, looking at other fields like statisticians or other, um, other fields um, that can contribute to judicial administration and the, um, improved efficiency of judicial administration. Thank you. I, I'll answer briefly because I do, I do not have a lot of experience with that, and my <laughs> colleagues may, or actually Steve might even, <laughs> Steve and Joel might want to even comment on that based on <coughs> best tracks, um, knowledge. But uh, it's, I think, I think the, the, there are individual academics who can, who can be of, of great help in this regard, who have certain kinds of expertise um, and at the same time, there are um, there are institutions that, through legal clinical legal education broadly defined, can sort of help the next generation understand what the challenges are and present more sort of systemic evidence of what is going on in the justice uh, sector sectors. Um, but I think. Um, the, the, based on the pedagogy, based on the flexibility, based on the teaching demands, you name it, of academics in most of these countries, it's extremely hard. And uh, maybe I misunderstood if you were talking about uh, uh, Western countries that, that are involved in doing work overseas, or you were really talking about domestic. Yeah, and I mean, I. Again, I welcome others to chime in here, but I mean, my experience has been they're, they're very difficult to engage on almost anything, whether it's training, even, even uh, data collection, et cetera. Uh, you, can, you can find individual academics who have a certain kind of training and predisposition to work as consultants who do have a way of presenting that evidence sometimes in academic forums that may or may not be that relevant themselves, but I've found that it's very difficult to, to get university or law school um, partners to really play the role we'd like them to play. And it's, and it's mostly just the educational system and the rigidities of the administration. There are plenty of faculty who would like to do that, and if given the opportunity to form a meaningful partnership. It could evolve over time, but there's tremendous academic leadership resistance. Uh, I, if I could tag on to that, I, I would agree with that. So what, what we have done and had, a, I think, a fair amount of success in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq is working with the students um, who I, I don't know, maybe because their, their fear of just living is so much greater that 
they're willing to go out on a limb and gather and get active sometimes rather than having paralegals it's the graduates of law schools who can't get a job when they first come out of law school that serve as paralegals uh, because a lot of time well, anyway and so the working with we tried to do some trial monitoring to have them do trial monitoring that has I've seen success in that a little bit I've seen success in them linking up with outside NGOs law students who link up with NGOs on the outside and go work in the NGOs because it's an opportunity for them to gain experience because they're not going to earn any money once they've graduated from law school they know that's a reality so they'll engage at that level We've had a, a number of different uh, student associations, student uh, sort of like a, a, like a young lawyers, but instead it's a student, you know, law student association where we work with them. But I, I will say that I've had more success in Afghanistan and Iraq with law schools, even, even with the professors to some extent, because uh, particularly in Afghanistan where they were so isolated and every legal book was uh, destroyed during all the different conflicts. So the law professors were actually excited and willing to work with trying to re you know, rewrite books, get books back in publication for the law students because there were no books for them to offer. Joel? I, I just add that um, this is a great question to end this panel on because I think legal education is one of the areas for greatest growth. Um, we recently were visited by, by Martine Bomer who sits in the Ministry of Justice of the government of Argentina and has an interesting portfolio that among other things involves engaging the ministry with civil society and legal education and universities. And we learned that uh, in, in Argentina there are no full-time law professors. Uh, law training is done exclusively by, ju by judges and, and lawyers, by practitioners. And the impact of that on the legal education system is significant for a number of reasons in terms of pedagogy and in terms of uh, training, but it also has tremendous implications for the work that academics could be doing to assist the judiciary. And this is an area that uh, Argentina, just as one example, is, is focused very much on changing. But they recognize that this is a, a decades-long process because you're talking about reforming the entire legal education system from the from the core, and it, it's it's a it's a it's a process that, that just to pick one example, sort of from a different region, that that will require tremendous um, support from the donor community, both uh, national and and multinational, and then also really a, a, an infusion inter internally uh, from the legal community, a demand to have that kind of training and not to have the training done by lawyers and judges exclusively. And so um, we were struck at Rolk when, when he came through that there was a, a clear desire from within the ministry to make this change, but it wasn't as clear that the law schools had the, had the, had the interest or desire or capacity to make this change. So these are, these are real challenges. I think it's a, it's a great question that shows another area where I think there's real need uh, for change going forward. I can't decide whether to look forward or backward, but I'll look both directions. <laughs> Thank you for that, Joel. Very briefly. Oh, certainly. Uh, just very briefly. I mean, we, I mentioned some examples of where clinical education is used, and I think it can be great, but we have to be supporting the quality to make sure that it is really uh, the justice that, that should be delivered is, is accessible and is of the right quality. Um, but I think that we should view these things as an investment in the future um, of countries, of the health of their legal systems. I haven't seen any integrated approaches like you're talking about, and I think that that would be a really interesting thing to look at. In terms of academics in general, though, I mean, one of the previous panelists, I can't remember who it was, talked about this culture of lawfulness in terms of political engagement in the national environment, and I think that's also a role that academic institutions, where they are willing, and I, I agree with Malcolm's points, um, to engage can really bring not just their, of course, their expertise and you know their their national standing, but very much credibility as well to some of the reform efforts. If you have academics who are nationally recognised and, uh, and applauded, being active in discourse around uh, justice reform, like we've seen in Tunisia, for instance, it can contribute to um, ensuring we have the right qualities of international standards within the culture on the ground that makes sense. And I think that's a specific role that academics can play because of their independence and because it times if they are credible of their standing thank you thank you okay i think we are wrapping this panel up 
and uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. As we transition from this panel to our keynote speaker, uh, uh, Hamid Khan, our deputy director, will be introducing our keynote speaker, Justice Jelani. Uh, I just want to mention one thing. This panel uh, spoke a little bit about uh, private enterprise, and in May of this year, uh, Just Track hosted a symposium here at the Wilson Center focused specifically on the intersection of rule of law and private enterprise. And so for those of you who weren't able to attend that, the video from that event is available on the Just Track website, and I'd commend that to you. And our videos are set up in a way that you can watch individual panels, so you don't have to sort of sit for eight straight hours, but you can break them up. And that, I think, s that, that brought together a large number of, of actors, and it was Hamid who organized that event. So I now turn uh, the floor over to Hamid.